<laughs> it's like intimidating. <laughs> Just so you know. Toys and later. Hi, everybody. I think we're ready to begin. Are we okay at the back? Okay. So, um, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Um, let me introduce everybody on the panel first, I think, uh, to start with. So on my uh, far left, uh, I'm pleased to say we have Sarah Hartley from Google DNI, who uh, is uh, funding, helping to fund, supporting uh, the News Things project, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Alison Gap, uh, Innovations Editor at Trinity Mirror. And on my right uh, is uh, Tom Metcalf, who's a principal of uh, creative design agency, Thomas Buchanan. And uh, last but hopefully not least, I guess no, you can make your no own, you can make your own <laughs> judgments on that uh, over the next hour. Uh, my name is John Mills. I'm a, a researcher uh, and lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK, um, and I work in the Media Innovation Studio, which is a, a research centre that specialises in uh, technology and storytelling, uh, particularly disruptive technology. So my background is in journalism. I'm a former editor, and I've kind of transitioned into the world of academia about 10 years ago. I still haven't figured out whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. That's under, under debate. So um, we're here to talk about news things. Now, the description in the program was a little bit limited, to be honest, so thanks for coming if you've just looked at the print version. It's an intriguing title. Um, we're quite, well, hopefully, actually, and, and uh, happy to be quite exotic, I think, at this festival because we are going to think about the Internet of Things. And I know that there was one panel thinking about IoT and security. Um, we're very much focused on things and physical objects, connected objects, for want of a better phrase, and start to ask questions and explore what that means for journalism, for media, for storytelling. Um, so we're right at the beginning of the project, which means that we don't really have that much data to share with you guys. Um, but what we thought was a good way to start this uh, panel was to talk about our previous work, to give you a lot of context and a flavour of the type of activities that we've been uh, doing over the last what, seven years, actually, in one case. So um, I'm already overdone my 30-second intro. So um, I'm just going to kind of get cracking. So connected objects, Internet of Things... My view on that is that we still aren't quite aware what, what that even means. And I've been in panels where people have spoke about connected cars, smart homes, Alexa is connected objects. Um, we've thinking about uh, the, the name of the fourth industrial revolution for manufacturing, smart factories, smart cities, playful cities. There's a lot of stuff wrapped in here. So I'm going to not be hugely encompassing. I'm going to be very specific. So this project, the slide uh, you can see in front of you is a project called uh, Bespoke, which ran for two years and sought to explore how design, product design and journalism could work together. And that box that you can see is called Viewpoint. So we were interested in if you put a physical computing device in a public area and invited people to use it, how they would use it. Um, this was in a place in Preston, the city that I work in, based in a community that was one of the 10% most deprived communities in the UK. And they said to us throughout the project, they don't feel represented by uh, local politicians. They don't feel represented by uh, some of the news and information ecosystem around them. So we thought, well, if you've got a connected object that you can interact with, has live data feeds, what would you do with that? So we uh, invited councillors, housing associations, et cetera, et cetera, to ask a question of that community once a week. Now, there's a social contract there, which was around if a councillor asked a question, the next week they would have to do something about it. They would have to respond to that community. And they would have the live data from this box. And the box had two buttons. Yes, no, agree, disagree. Really simple, hopefully elegant. The most, well, um, the most popular question is, excuse the language here, is dog shit a problem in your area? Yes, was the response, and the council had to do something about it. So we're interested in how a physical device that is connected to the web and can help people communicate can have some kind of impact. Okay, so next slide, connected objects, Google Glass. That worked, didn't it? Look at it, everybody's wearing them, everywhere. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Google man. Um, so uh, working with Alison at Trintamere and others, wearables, connected objects, how do journalists use this? So I uh, 
did a little bit of work trying to understand how this disruptive technology in a newsroom would play out and what the challenges and opportunities were. Interestingly, uh, the adoption, particularly Manchester Evening News and Liverpool Echo, was fantastic. I mean, reporters thought this was a really useful tool in terms of video acquisition, in terms of a new way to, to tell stories. Um, the next slide actually is interesting in terms of giving the opportunity for reporters to have that first person perspective of video. This is a story from Stockport um, where the reporter walked around some caves where there was a homeless community living and you got a really powerful sense of, 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 of a real lived experience. Equally, findings, newsroom pressures, uh, disseminating innovations, I and mean, Alison can speak about that in much more detail than I can. The web connectivity wasn't really used. Didn't happen. No live data streams. Smartphones, great, communicating with the office. Glass as a device, didn't, didn't seem appealing. Wearable video camera, great. Connected device, no. Um, okay, so another example. I'm gonna try to rush on now. Some, okay, thank you. you. You've delegated back to me, I love that. So, um, part of my role is at the Civic Drone Center. Drones now are over the tipping point. Yeah, the drones have been used for journalism all over the world. Some fantastic footage, both from citizens and from professional journalists. Really cool stuff. We're interested in what happens when you connect a drone to the web. So um, this uh, is a project called Eracy, which again is quite old, 2013. We said, okay, so if you've got a drone taking images and you can stream images to a public, can, can, can you achieve other things? So there's a scenario here which is there's a missing hiker on a mountain. This is not a journalism project, by the way. This is a humanitarian search and rescue project. So if you have somebody missing on a mountain, can a drone flying over an area uh, find that person with the assistance of the crowd? So all those images were sent to a website in a live way. So I've said that about four times now. Uh, a community of around... A, 350 people around the world looked for a person. If they saw somebody who looked like a person, they tagged an image on their browser or on their screen. Um, we found that a connected drone was pretty effective. Um, we found the missing person within 69 seconds. Well, we didn't. We found the image that could have the missing person on it within 69 seconds because people recognised... That man. Remember, this is a mock-up. This is Darren Ansell, the lead for aerospace and uh, space at UCLan. Yes. Prostrate. Um, we found that through that tagging, through people interacting, we could we could get a much kind of quicker read of that data than we could do through machine learning at that time. Maybe now it wouldn't be so much the case. Uh, but we're also interested in if you put web-connected drones in the hands of journalists what would happen. So this is a, a drone hack session I ran at the end of January. If you could put sensors on a drone, connect them to the web, what kind of new and innovative stories could you tell? So UAVs, not for audio and visual, but for other types of data being connected to the internet. So they're the kind of projects that I've worked on in the past, thinking about connected objects. And what I'm trying to show there is actually there's a huge amount of diversity in how you read that and how you present that and some of the uses. So that was just a bit about me. I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to hand over to Alison. Okay, so hello. Uh, I'm the uh, digital innovation editor for Trinity Mirror. And my role is essentially audience engagement, new ways of telling stories, and kind of new models for, for journalism. Um, and it's a wide brief, and what's really lovely about it is that I don't really have any KPIs. <coughs> the, the goal is just try things and, and let's push ourselves because we needed a space within our very large like, mainstream media company that does digital and print, um, where we were trying new things, um, where people were not pressured to produce an outcome with it, but could just experiment. And I really like, fundamentally believe that play in our newsrooms, it doesn't happen enough. And, and the more we do it, the more exciting things come out. I also believe, if you're a journalist, it's really great to hang out with the nerd herd. Um, <laughs> because you learn so much. And they, like, your accepted norms of like, what, what a story is and how it should work is completely challenged um, by, by their different approaches. So this, um, this is an Internet of Things um, device that's in one of our newsrooms. It's, uh, it's, the, the, uh, it's a liver bird, which is the symbol of the city of Liverpool in the UK. There are 11 liver birds in the city, but the two that people know are on the liver building, and the female liver bird looks out to sea to protect the sailors, and the male liver bird looks out over the city, apparently to protect the city, but 
most people say he's looking for, for pubs. Um, so that's, that's kind of, the liver bird is a huge kind of uh, emotional thing in Liverpool. And, and the Liverpool Echo, um, which is the, the news, uh, well, it was the newspaper, but now it's obviously a complete media business in Liverpool, had a sign that had the liver bird in it. And when that sign was replaced, um, the liver bird was taken down and it wasn't going to go anywhere. It was kind of forgotten about. So we took it. Uh, it was rescued from a skip and uh, we turned it into a connected device that shows audience engagement. What you can see there, the blue, is um, it turned blue in response to uh, an Everton football club match that was happening and, and it's indicating sentiment uh, in the newsroom around that match. So uh, it's kind of reminding our journalists all the time that there are people beyond the newsroom walls who are doing things and talking about things on networks, etc. Um, so this is a really short video. And as you can see, I can't spell engagement, although I do talk about it a lot. Um, so basically, what we did was we partnered with a, a little maker community in Liverpool um, called Does Liverpool Design Studios, Liverpool essentially, um, and brought them into the newsroom. Adrian came in and he made that. While journalists were kind of ringing the police and writing stories and filming videos around him as part of their day-to-day -day job, there was an Arduino set of uh, tools at work and soldering happening in, in the newsroom so people could actually see it happening. And it, it was just a way of showing our journalists that the screen in front of them that they were typing into wasn't the only way that stories could be told. And we're going to use the, uh, the live bird quite a lot around like, elections and areas where we, where we want to kind of measure sentiment. And it actually goes out into the community as well and they use it. So it's a kind of giving back to the city of the live bird. Thank you, Alison. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over to Tom um, to talk about his work, which is coming from a different direction, I guess. <coughs> cool. So, yeah, I'm Tom. I'm principal at a design and innovation studio called Thomas Buchanan, um, and we principally help um, a variety of clients to develop concepts and propositions. Um, and we often do this through lots of iterative prototyping and testing and analysis. Um, but our work is quite eclectic. We, we do quite a lot of different things. Um, there is a common thread to it, although there's, we really do focus on people and the way that people interact and, uh, with the world or experience the world. Um, and so our, our people that within the, the studio um, have got transferable skills, but there's lots of uh, people who are experiencing behavior in there. Um, but we're principally designers. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few projects that we've done just to give you a bit of a, a breadth. So um, this is Raincloud. Uh, so Raincloud is a <coughs> Raincloud is a small weather device. I'll just so you can see it. There we go. So Raincloud looks giant up there, but he's about this big. Um, and Raincloud will tell you whether it's going to rain today through the behaviour of those droplets. So there are little LEDs behind there, and there'll be an animation through those droplets telling you the severity of the weather or the precipitation of the day. So you basically know whether you need to take your raincoat or not today. Um, and this has really come out of uh, an insight that push notifications just don't work. And they, they arrive at the wrong time. Um, they're, you can't, uh, they're unactionable at that moment. Um, so you can place this little internet connected object where you need it to be, so next to your jacket or your umbrella. And if, the, if, it's, if it's raining or it's going to rain today, the droplets, as I say, will will animate and you just take your umbrella um, and it's as simple as that so it's a very we call these potentially we call these physical apps they're very simple they do one thing um, but it's a lot about data here isn't it we're pulling data from the, the internet from um, a really accurate weather data from uh, that's been uh, from the Met Office in, in the UK um, and we're, we're visualizing it essentially 
so that would be one project. There is again. Um, so, and as as uh, as I said before about experience, we really have um, we understood people's behaviour and their routine in the morning, um, and it really came from that. And the no notifications was clearly a, a, a problem. So going a little bit further away from that, um, there is digital technology of some form in all of all of our work. Um, but this is uh, one of our projects, it's a brand activation project we did with Innocent Gun, which is a Scottish beer company. Um, and we had this crazy idea that we would harvest moisture from clouds and make it into beer. Um, so we had to make a contraption that could do that. Uh, and we were working with a PR agency, of course, and it was part of a crowdfunding campaign where they, they were very successful, so it had major impact. Um, but this is in the Highlands in Scotland, um, and uh, this is a big power kite with our cloud harvester attached to it. You might be able to see that there. And really, it's some amazing strong guy at the bottom holding it. Um, but the harvester ended up looking like this. This is Loch Lomond. And uh, um, yeah, this has got bits of digital technology. It, we, I think with the internet things, we often uh, think it's the only way of communicating over distance th through Wi-Fi, but there's loads of many other protocols, which I won't go into, but we, radio is one that's been around for a very long time, and it's, it's a classic um, a communication technology that uh, isn't used enough in IoT. So, brand activation project. Um, so, and then the other, going back to something that's much more around experience, um, we did this project with a company called Unmade. Um, they're, a, they're a fashion brand now, um, and they came to us to redesign or design the experience of a concept store. So um, this is uh, in Covent Garden in London. Um, and on, on the right, this is the, the store we ended up designing. So this, so to give you a little bit about Unmade, they're really disrupting the fashion industry actually um, because they, they're they part of this new wave. The, we've mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. What that essentially means is a lot of connected technologies, data, um, digital manufacturing, like 3D printing. Um, but in, the, in their case, they're actually um, doing bespoke, one-off knitted garments. Um, so the digital front end is really quite amazing because you can manipulate garments online on a tablet or on a, or a website. Um, and uh, when you're happy with it, you just put knit and that's unique to you and it will just be knitted on a knitting machine. And you can see on the I need to put it up on the right. This is inside the store. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see the knitting machine. Um, so your garment would be, or your scarf would be knitted in store. So they're really disrupting the fashion industry. And their whole business model is very interesting because you can't actually buy anything in store. So it's a really interesting way to see how digital um, has a role um, within the physical connected world. Um, and just another sort of shot of the outside. Pretty cool. Um, okay, so that was just a bit, bit of a glimpse of the type of breadth of work that we work on. Everything from the experience, the way people will go through stores, through to um, more consumer products that would, would live in uh, live in your home, and crazy brand activation projects. So cool. Okay, so um, the purpose of that run through was um, to give you again. T Tom's kind of just alluded to this: the, the breadth of potential activity under an IoT guise and, and what IoT could be from very different perspectives from a from a design or from a kind of academic kind of product creation or from a newsroom. Now the thing that I honestly get excited about is when you say okay well what happens when you put all that stuff together? Yeah if you're thinking about innovation and if you're thinking about uh, progressive activities is there a nice opportunity for um, Newsrooms that Alison works with, to work with academia, to work with product designers specialising in digital technologies, to come up with new concepts that may not otherwise emerge in each of our, each of our silos. So we've done one project together previously before we get onto news things, even though all of these are kind of news things in one way, shape or form, uh, which was called uh, Echo, an interface of things. So we're just going to um, show you a video um, that is purposefully disruptive, and it's driven by a couple of things for me. One is, so we've all got, we've all got these, yeah? But actually, if the future of digital is screen-based, well, I think that's a little bit sad. I think there's more to life than screens. And 
in the projects that I've done in a couple of different guises, I hear from readers, users, audiences, whichever word you want to know, their passion for paper. Um, so I'm an academic, I get a chance to play. What happens when you connect print to the web? just gone up indicates four minutes of stoppage time. Liverpool were 3-2 down to West Ham in the 2006 FA Cup final in Cardiff. A 1-1 draw in the Premier League with Middlesbrough at Anfield in April 2005. The Stephen Gerrard story doesn't end here. Of course one day he'll be back. He will have another part to play in Liverpool's future. Before then, there was a new chapter in his life as he heads for Major League Soccer to play for LA Galaxy. That chapter will begin in July. Just four minutes were left as Liverpool chased the third goal they desperately required against Olympiacos to progress to the knockout stages of the Champions League. Okay, so uh, that's a prototype project. It's playing with printed electronics, conductive inks. Um, it is not scalable at the moment. I'm not pretending for a second we can suddenly have newspapers that can talk to you. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that um, in a realistic and recognisable amount of time, the components that are involved in that prototype will be printable, uh, printable batteries. What kind of activities can you do around paper forms? Now, we mocked up a, um, a recognisable supplement there, but actually posters, tickets, um, receipts that are connected to the web. What does that mean for storytelling? What does that mean for interactions? And actually, it's formative research. We don't know. We're trying to figure out how to find out, even in some instances, but that's why it's interesting and exciting. So, um, again, we're just running through this, I think, at pace, and we can kind of We'll talk a little bit more about some of the themes as we go, but again, just playing with objects and news and information. So I don't know, Tom, you want to talk a little bit about Snow Day? Yeah. So quickly on this, another exploration we did. So sorry. So yeah, Snow Day. He's about this big. Give you scale. Um, so Snow Day uh, essentially is a an object that is so it's open source. So all the files. Um, to make snow days are available uh, um, online. Um, and uh, it's got a little bit of internet connected technology in it. It's 3D printed. Um, but the idea is that uh, a teenager, um, a, young, a young person would be able to print it off, put the technology inside really easily, and would have a little bit of agency around um, whether their schools were open or closed in a day or not. That's the wrong way around it. It's them knowing whether a school is closed today. So the idea is here is that the snow day would sit in their home um, and if they picked Snow Day up and the tummy glowed, they would know that school was closed today. Now, in the, up in the UK, Scotland, when snow, the reason it's called Snow Day is that if it was snowing, you'd probably be off school. It probably happened less here. Um, but the, um, that was a really, we were, the research around this was looking at rare occurrence. So how far could we push these, the, the, the frequent interactions? So snow, a Snow Day, cancelling of school might only happen a couple of times a year. Um, so we're trying to build trust around objects here and would they keep picking it up every day to see if just in case school was closed. So we were doing a bit of research around that. It was quite, quite interesting. Um, can I go on? I was going to interrupt, but I'm going to not because okay. I always do that and I'm really annoying. So well, I think, I think <laughs> well, it's all right. It's all right. Well, I just, so it's the final one that's out of uh, rare occurrence is also in frequency. So in frequency was sort of the um, more... Uh, Focus piece of research around um, that that family of objects which Snow Day and Infrequence was a part of. So, 
In frequency, um, you'll notice there's no screens there. Um, we really are um, exploring areas of, uh, that have no screens, from everything from interactive print through to physical connected objects. And this is, um, this is essentially a podcast player. Um, and uh, it, you, you select what you'd like to listen to, whether that's comedy or whatever, and then it, to make it go, you rock it. And I've got a video, actually, that'll probably explain it better, um, hopefully better. newspaper for a visual world. Hello, Buglers, and welcome to issue 4006 of the world's last remaining outpost of truth. Yes, I think that's fair in 2016. It's close enough. It's the Bugle podcast, the show that, according to recent scientific research, had it existed... So, there's a number of things to this. This is really trying to... Um, one of the big counter things to the phone or the, is that you're interacting with the same material, whatever content you're engaging with. Um, and we really wanted to go away from that and start to uh, um, look at materiality. I'm going, we can probably come back to that a bit later. So these are an example of some of the projects we've then worked on together um, that have really led into our next um, area of exploration with news things um, and uh, our, our latest funded project um, by Google. So... So, I'm really pleased that Sarah can make the panel today. Um, so, we as a team were looking for opportunities, Google uh, DNI fund. Sarah, if you could tell us Thanks. a little bit about... Is I'm yes, just going to move around here so I can do the slides and stand up as well. An interactive... So it's no, oh, interactive. No, 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 you stay where you are. That's fine. Um, I'll just lean over you. Um, so, yeah, this is a bit unusual. Um, my involvement in this project is minimal, but quite important in a way and um, I'm from the Google Digital News Innovation Fund and um, I was a bit surprised to be asked by these guys if I'd like to come along but very happy to attend and I think it kind of shows the collaborative effort they've got with the design side, the academic side and the newsroom side and they also uh, involving kind of the funding side as well so it's obviously a very well thought out project but I thought it might be interesting just to share a little bit about uh, the fund that's behind them just for a few minutes and if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards or fancies applying to the fund we do have a round open at the moment uh, we are looking for good news innovation ideas so please do see me afterwards but very briefly um, the, the, f the fund is uh, obviously run by Google, who've put up 150 million euros over the next uh, three years to support news innovation. And just make sure I'm right there. It's open to anybody in the EU, and that is anybody who's involved in news. Uh, so it's any, anything from kind of a one-man band startup to a collaboration like these guys, or a massive legacy news industry. Um, there's three elements to it. There's the prototype one, which is where we are with these guys. Um, medium projects, which is up to 300,000 uh, euros, and large projects, which go up to a million euros. So we kind of fit any of them. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but I will say that if anybody here is looking to uh, apply to it. As I say, we are open at the moment and we very much encourage uh, prototype projects like this to come forward that have like a, just a, a year to try something really different out as well as really big thought out projects. So thanks to them for inviting me and I'll let them continue with their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so I'm going to put this down. Um, so what news... What is news thing? So we've talked about some previous projects. So the, the work that we're going to do now is um, Trinity Mirror, Media Innovation Studio, and Thomas Buchanan to try to create and iterate new connected projects. Now, um, we're going to do that in a very specific way, which is that we're going to work with people. We're going to work with audiences. So I'm just going to spend 30 seconds going through the process. Um, 
In the last couple of weeks, we've had some creative workshops in Manchester and uh, Bristol with uh, audience members from Trinity Mirror and their publications there. And the idea is for readers to start talking to us about their news consumption, but not starting with their digital consumption. We want to, to talk to them. We want to talk to them about when they are consuming news, where they are consuming news, what kind of news they're consuming. But also how they feel about it, actually. What kind of emotional response do they get from news and information? Where in their homes? Who are they with, actually? So can, we're all really conscious of the advantages of analytics. I mean, and Alison can, can speak extensively on that in a huge amount of detail. But actually, we want a, a kind of a broader story. So that's where we start. We're then going to... Uh, and they tell us this information. We're then going to give them... Um, what Tom describes as a cultural probe which sounds kind of quite intense, but it basically it's a kit, it's a camera, a couple of other sensors, and ask people to carry them around with them over the course of the day, take pictures of their environment, record how they feel, record what they do when they're capturing news and other things. And actually, it's a broad definition of news. It's when they're talking to their neighbour over the fence about what's happening down the street. It's when they get an email from their nephew who's travelling in Australia. It's, it's very broad. We want to start as in, a, in a larger base as possible to try to create objects that are relevant and have empathy or can generate empathy. And maybe even, I'm going to dare to use the word, kind of love. I mean, some objects that you will have in your homes, you love. They mean something to you. And I think that that's something that I'm, as an academic, really interested in, the emotion that you might have with a thing, not just the functionality of a thing. Um, then Tom will work really hard building things. Yes. Then we will put them in people's homes and capture more data and hopefully iterate. So we're right at the very beginning of the, of the process in many respects. Um, for me, in a kind of academic standpoint, I've already mentioned about the um, emotional responses. I'm really interested in how news can be de deconstructed. And I, I really love Tom's Rain Cloud project because weather on a website, a news website, it gets a huge amount of traffic. I think, actually, if you can start to think of the assets that a news publisher has and the kind of data that they generate, they deal with every day, how can you reinterpret that? How can you adapt it? How can you work with it in new forms that aren't necessarily on a smartphone or a tablet or a, 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 a laptop base unit? I could keep going, couldn't I? Um, the, the other thing is, and again, this is a little bit cliched, and I kind of apologise for it, but I think in many respects, the news media really struggled with the advent of the web. They, they've been playing catch-up for a long time in terms of how to handle it, both, well, in every way, whether that's skills, monetization, um, communication. It's just been a challenge, I think. And actually, the Internet of Things, in whatever form it comes across, and it takes, it will be a huge facet of our lives moving forward. There are 11 million Alexas already after a number of months of being on the market. This is coming. And I think to the news media being in at the beginning, thinking about it at the beginning, it might not be objects, it might be sensor networks, it might be reading smart cities, it might be an open data agenda. I have no idea. But I think for me, it's really important that people are thinking about it now. Otherwise, the chance to form and to inform this uh, this sector is going to have passed. Okay, so the reason that Trinity Mirror is involved in this is um, essentially, if you think back to social networks and when they started to gain traction, the titles that, that we work with who really joined Twitter, who engaged with those early adopter communities, it benefited them massively. When people arrive in a new platform, the first thing they do is look for, fami for the familiar. And be, I work in local news, news, so there aren't many things that are much more familiar to people than their local uh, title. Um, I was in a coffee shop the other day, uh, and it was in Liverpool, and a four-year-old boy said, w looked out the window and said to his grandmother, Nan, there's the echo. I love the echo. And I thought, that's so great. I mean... How was, when was the last time that I thought I really loved something that, that I, I work with all the time? And how often these days would anybody say that about a news brand? And I have to say that that is not uh, something that you would hear across most of ours. You know, it, it was a fairly unique moment and I treasure it. Um, but to be able to do this and, and be in with news things and start exploring where we are um, in terms of 
connectivity and, and things in people's homes in the way that a physical newspaper used to be on the kitchen table where you'd come in from work and you, you know it would be passed around and read. I think this really speaks to uh, an emotional bond and it, it also, I believe in the days when you've got kind of mainstream media not being the most popular thing, it is a, you know, in people's kind of hearts, it is a way of re-establishing a connection with communities that potentially we've forgotten or, or not engaged with as we should. So the, the idea of getting our, for example, in, in Bristol Evening Post content or the Manchester Evening News content in these trials into people's homes, so it's telling them, like, traffic and travel, the weather, the on a Wednesday, it might be like telling them, here's some things you want to do at the weekend, start planning now. It might have deals in it that are going on, so there might, you know, or, or sales, that are going, or anything. There is huge commercial opportunity, I think, in this, as well as editorial. Um, and what's really great with, with the Google backing is that we've got that kind of space to play around with it and, and do something that... Won't, there won't be a patent at the end of it. You know, Trinity Mirror is not suddenly going to release a, a device. Um, but what we will have is a, is a better understanding of our audience, a better understanding, I think, of where we fit in all of that. Um, and potentially it will have stretched our brains to try and think about the journalism we do um, and, and the way that we, we put our content out there in a new way. When I was talking to John initially about this, and he said to me, um, suppose your train ticket could also tell you traffic and travel. And I was like, that would be so bloody awesome. Um, and, and that was kind of the thing that really sparked it for me, that idea of the surfaces being able to give you information in the way that the surface of a newspaper or you know, the, the app on this can give you information. It's really exciting. Um, so I think, have we moved to the end of that? And do you want to go into questions? Or? Yeah, I don't just, know, Tom. Yeah, I'll be very brief, maybe on why no, you've got plenty it of feels like the. I mean, you, you, so why why am I involved with this project? I guess would be a good continuation. Um, so all our work comes from our focus is on the user, the people, um, customers. Um, so I'm not coming from a uh, from a research necessarily from a research perspective, and certainly not from a news and journalism perspective. And my approach to this would be. Um, something more like, are people engaging with news in a way that they want to engage with news? And if you start with that as a question, rather than from a, with a, a journalism or media or publisher lens, that could be quite interesting. And if you start, so we're starting with that question, and we're very, very comfortable with process now. So um, we know how this will end up with um, some very tested prototypes at the end and how we could then take it into manufacture. So if we just start with that as our proposition, and then take it from there. And it's exactly what John is saying. We, we start with that. We really want to understand how um, people engage with news, where they are, how they feel, absolutely how they feel. Um, and then we allow that to build ideas and then prototypes off the back of that. Um, and I think for us, that's, as, that's as very simply why we're involved with the project. We've also done, you know, the other thing, of course, very quickly, is that the collaboration is so important. And we, we know this is a... It's a fun, good team to work in. Um, we've done some interesting things in the past and um, we haven't quite got to the point where um, I think we've demonstrated what we can do. So I think this is a good yeah. opportunity for that. I, I would like just stress so much, if, if you work in journalism, do try and, and like make friendships and forge partnerships and whatever you want to call it, but just go and talk to the makers in your community because the people who are working in that kind of digital space, I, I learn so much from them, and they're so interesting. And working with the Innovation Lab at UCLan, it's, it's, they, they love journalism, but they come at journalism from a different way that I do. So, you know, you will always... I was, I was there the other week, uh, we had a chat about kind of sensor data, and I went away, thought about it, and uh, I pitched an idea to one of our newsrooms now to do a, a big investigative project um, using sensor data which I would, I would never have thought of if I hadn't had a coffee with, with these two. Um, I wouldn't even really have known much about sensor data and the opportunities that it could afford for news. So just moving beyond your usual sources, the, the contacts that you have in, into kind of the, the world of, um, kind of slightly off to the side of, of in journalism and information technology, really, 
um, is, is just a great way, I think, of expanding your skill set, and I, I'd really recommend it. Sarah, do you have anything that you want to add, or should we move to questions? Okay, so it's a really um, thick and weighty subject, um, and I, I appreciate that some of this is a bit kind of impenetrable, just because we're at the very early stages of it, but if people have got questions around um, how to get involved in something like this, um, what actually the, uh, the Internet of Things is, and, and why it's important. Are we doing it because it's shiny, or are we doing it because we genuinely think that there is an outcome for it? Um, you know, then you've got a couple of experts here who can really answer those. So I don't know if you've got any microphones, but I've got one here, so I'm quite happy to do the running around. Okay, let's yeah. okay. do that. Thank you. Um, I would, I'm just an end user, I'm not a journalist. Uh, I would like to hear some comments about privacy issues. If you take the first picture, the one with the poll box in the, in the shop, uh, mm -hmm. which is a very nice idea, I mean, to, to engage the community in the participation in the politics. But if you cross match the data of that guy telephone with the timestamp of the vote casted, you can, exactly, you, can, you can know exactly how that guy voted. Uh, what are his sexual orientation, what is his, what, what is does in his life. And the biggest problem is that uh, we don't have, I mean, even you don't have control over who is using that data. That's the, 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 the biggest problem for me. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, um, yeah. I'll kick off with that. Um, I think there are, some f there are some fundamental challenges with data, and I think... Um, I hadn't thought of viewpoint in that way, to be perfectly honest, in the, the identify element of the, those interactions and, and, and voting. I think, I think reading through policy position reports um, from the EU and from the UK, um, security and privacy is recognised as a, as a fundamental issue for IoT. Um, in many respects, it's the Wild West, uh, in that there is... Uh, Regulatory frameworks are still being assessed. I mean, everybody's read the kind of pop horror stories of hackable TVs, hackable devices, hackable drones. It was something that we did a little bit of work on in that it is incredibly easy to hack a drone anonymously, actually. So I think this project, this project is quite self-explicitly playful. And the users who we'll work with understand that uh, they're participating and that they provide their data. Um, and I, just in terms of this project, I have to go through lots of processes with our ethics committee to ensure that anybody who engages with us is, has the level of protection that they have. But I think much more widely, um, this is going to be a challenge, I think. And to some extent, it's, it's finding the balance that users are happy with because on occasion, users are happy for their data to be used and reappropriated. So it's a, again, it's a conversation. It's understanding where the lines lay. So I, I don't have a, a solid position, but I think it, it is absolutely in need of attention. I'm going to ask Tom to see if... I, I, I totally agree. I'll just top, top it up a little bit. Um, so in our, in our context, there, there's two points. Ecosystems are very important. So... Um, if you're an IoT company, you don't try and do everything yourself. You work with companies that are specialising in developing platforms where security and privacy is very high of their um, of their their values. So there are companies that we work with, like Electric Imp, for example, out of um, out of the west coast of the US, who who are at the cutting edge of security and IoT. So that would be one one solution that we're looking at because that that we don't know enough about the security, of course. And secondly, the, it's a little bit more of a, an obvious one. It really depends what sensors are in the objects. So uh, I don't think we can tar the whole spectrum of IoT with the same brush, in a sense. If you're um, rain cloud, for example, it's an Internet of Things object. It has no sensors in it. You are just, you are just sending data to that IoT object, um, and it's displaying it. Um, but it also... Um, the other way around, if you're sending data to a, to a cloud and it's just got a temperature sensor in it, it's part of IoT, then you probably can't infer anything about the, the user from that. So it, uh, it really depends on what the product is. Um, uh, yeah, and, and obviously Alexa and voice commands, that's, that's actually um, a lot more 
complicated, I think, than just physical objects that are, have sensors in them. Okay, great. Anybody else got a question? No? Okay, cool. Well, I think in that case, we've got another session building up outside, so we'll pull this to a close. Thank you very much, everybody. And like Sarah said, if you've got DNI questions, she's around. If you've got questions around how to fill the form from the end user point of view, uh, we're around, so just grab hold of us and ask. Okay, thank you ever so much for your time. So we're right at the beginning of the project, which means that we don't really have that much data to share with you guys. Um, but what we thought was a good way to start this uh, panel was to talk about our previous work, to give you a lot of context and a flavour of the type of activities that we've been uh, doing over the last what, seven years, actually, in one case. So. Um, I'm already overdone my 30-second intro, so um, I'm just going to kind of get cracking. So, connected objects, Internet of Things, my view on that is that we still aren't quite aware what, what that even means. And I've been in panels where people have spoke about connected cars, smart homes, Alexa is connected objects. Um, we've thinking about uh, the the name of the fourth industrial revolution for manufacturing, smart factories, smart cities, playful cities. There's a lot of stuff wrapped in here. So I'm going to not be hugely encompassing. I'm going to be very specific. So this project, the slide uh, you can see in front of you is a project called... Uh, oh. <laughs> this slide intimidating. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I think we're ready to begin. Are we okay at the back? Okay. So, um, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Um, let me introduce everybody on the panel first, I think, uh, to start with. So, on my uh, far left, uh, I'm pleased to say we have Sarah Hartley from Google DNA who uh, is uh, funding, helping to fund, supporting uh, the News Things project, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Alison Gap, uh, Innovations Editor at Trinity Mirror. And on my right uh, is uh, Tom Metcalf, who's a principal of uh, creative design agency, Thomas Buchanan. And uh, last but hopefully not least, I guess no, you can make your no own, you can make your own <laughs> judgments on that uh, over the next hour. Uh, my name is John Mills. I'm a, a researcher uh, and lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK, um, and I work in the Media Innovation Studio, which is a, a research centre that specialises in uh, technology and storytelling, uh, particularly disruptive technology. So my background is in journalism. I'm a former editor, and I've kind of transitioned into the world of academia about 10 years ago. I still haven't figured out whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. That's under, under debate. So um, we're here to talk about news things. Now, the description in the program was a little bit limited, to be honest. So thanks for coming, if you've just looked at the print version. It's an intriguing title. Um, we're quite, well, hopefully, actually, and, and uh, happy to be quite exotic, I think, at this festival, because we are going to think about the Internet of Things. And I know that there was one panel thinking about IoT and security. Um, we're very much focused on things and physical objects, connected objects, for want of a better phrase, and start to ask questions and explore what that means for journalism, for media, for storytelling. Um, we disagree. Really simple, hopefully elegant. The most, well, um, the most popular question is, excuse the language here, is dog shit a problem in your area? Yes, was the response, and the council had to do something about it. So we're interested in how a physical device that is connected to the web and can help people communicate can have some kind of impact. Okay, so next slide, connected objects, Google Glass. That worked, didn't it? Look at it, everybody's wearing them, everywhere. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Google man. Um, so uh, working with Alison Trintamere and others, wearables, connected objects, how do journalists use this? So I uh, did a little bit of work trying to understand how this disruptive technology in a newsroom would play out and what the challenges and opportunities were. Interestingly, uh, the adoption, particularly Manchester Evening News and Liverpool Echo, was fantastic. I mean, reporters thought this was a really useful tool in terms of video acquisition, in terms of a new way to, to tell stories. 
um, the next book, which ran for two years and sought to explore how design, product design and journalism could work together. And that box that you can see is called Viewpoint. So we were interested in if you put a physical computing device in a public area and invited people to use it, how they would use it. Um, this was in a place in Preston, the city that I work in, based in a community that was one of the 10% most deprived communities in the UK. And they said to us throughout the project, they don't feel represented by uh, local politicians. They don't feel represented by uh, some of the news and information ecosystem around them. So we thought, well, if you've got a connected object that you can interact with, has live data feeds, what would you do with that? So we... Uh, invited councillors, housing associations, et cetera, et cetera, to ask a question of that community once a week. Now, there's a social contract there, which was around if a councillor asked a question, the next week they would have to do something about it. They would have to respond to that community. And they would have the live data from this box. And the box had two buttons, yes, no, 